praise team. Take your copy of God's Word and go with me to Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5, pick you up in verse number 16. As we pick our series back up on sanctification, growing in Christ. And if you're ages 2 through 5, if you will follow Miss Ashley down at Children's Church. Ages 2 through 5, and it looks like they're sliding out the door. Carrie Jo is helping her today. and That's good. Galatians chapter 5, picking up in verse number 16. Galatians 5, picking up in verse number 16. And the scriptures say, But I say, Walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other, to keep you from doing the things you want to do. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are evident. Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, adultery, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and like thing, things like these. I warned you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Now, Father... We pray as we open your word this morning and continue our series on the truth of sanctification that you will speak to us again today that we may hear your truth. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Now throughout all of the New Testament, the Bible, the New Testament teaches us that those who are believers are in a spiritual warfare. You are in a battle. If you know Christ as your Savior, there is a spiritual warfare going on. And it is a warfare between the Holy Spirit and the flesh. The Holy Spirit and the flesh. Now I want to tell you, now I want you to understand something. As long as you're in this flesh, as long as you live in this world, you are going to have that battle. Now let me say that again right off to the offset You're going to be in a battle until the Lord Jesus calls you home if you're here today and you know Christ as your Savior. There's going to be that pull and that tug. There's going to be the wrestle of the Spirit. There's going to be the desire for you to please God. And yet the pull of the flesh is going to be there also. It is a reality for every believer. Now having said that, that is what the flesh, that is why the flesh does. The flesh tries to lead a believer away from a God-centered life, away from a life that is pleasing to Christ, honoring Christ. Now remember, we've already seen that if you're a believer, God does it what? God doesn't leave you where you are. Amen. Aren't you glad of that? You can't just keep setting in your sin. You cannot be satisfied in your sin. You you will be troubled and, and, and you want to move past that. There's a desire in your life to move past that and to live a holy life honoring to Christ. And as long as you're sitting there, if you're sitting there and you're not miserable, probably not saved. If you're living a lifestyle that is not pleasing to Christ, you're probably not a believer. Because God is not satisfied to keep you where you are. God, the Holy Spirit, lives in you. He's going to... He's going to prune your life, move things out of your life. There is going to always be that battle with the spirit and the flesh. Now, when we think of the word flesh, what do we think of usually? Well, we think of this body. We think of the flesh. We think of it. We think of, the, of, of all of the things that go on, the blood that flows through it, the veins. This, this is the physical nature. That's what we think of. And when sometimes we read a text like this, That is what we begin to go to. That's where we run to. But in Scripture, flesh sometimes refers to the body and other times refers to something else besides the body. 
There's two Greek words in the, in the New Testament. One word is S-O-M-A, and I'm going to say that means that, that word is soma. The second word is S-R-X, and that word is sarx. Soma and sarx. Well, that's a good history. Let's try. Say that with me this morning. Soma and sarx. Let's say it one more time. It just sounds good, doesn't it? Soma, sarx. Those are the two Greek words that are talking about physical things that are going on in our lives. So the word soma, the word soma normally refers to a physical body. The bodies we see in this building today. That's what it normally refers to. Normally the word soma has no meaning to the sinfulness of our lives. It has nothing meaning of the fallen state of our lives. It is just simply normally. Now let me say that. Normally it is just simply the bodies that we live in. It is the flesh that we have. It is the, it is the uh, ligaments that make us up. It is the veins that make us up. It is the heart and the lungs and the eyes and the ears and all that is pertained to the body. That's what it normally means. But there's a second word, and that word is sarks. And that word sometimes does refer to the physical body. It also can refer to the physical body. At other times, though, at other times, it refers to other things. It refers to the fallen nature that all men and women possess. That we are born fallen. That humanity is born fallen. We are born guilty. You see, the word sarks describes our corruption. That's what it describes. It describes that we are corrupted as the song that somebody sang many times was, we're wicked deep down. You get it? We're wicked deep down. It describes our, destruction, our, our corruption. And it's not limited to our physical bodies. It is describing the whole person of who we are, our mental, factivity, our, our mental fac- faculties, every thing about us because you see here's the deal here's the deal your and my life is geared to please ourselves now you got to get that listen your and my life are geared to please ourselves we said this a couple of weeks ago during the Christmas series that if you had a blue dye and you ate that blue dye all of your body would be blue some of it would be dark blue some of it would be light blue but all of it would be blue. Every part of your body would have a shade of blue to it. And that is the problem with man. We are all corrupt. Every bit of it is corrupt. All of us have corruption just oozing out of our bodies. We are, we are that way. And that's what this word is describing. It's describing the whole person. That we are a fallen in rebellion against God, enemy of God, individual. That's who we are. That's what this word means. And it means that we desire to live for ourselves. Amen. Can we all just be honest here a minute? All of us here, we need to understand that's really what we want to do. We want to live for ourselves. We want what pleases us, what makes us more comfortable, what is better for us. We don't really want to go a second mile. We don't really desire to do that. It is the Holy Spirit of God that moves us to be that way. So, having said that, what does it mean? What does all of this mean? Well, first of all, I want you to notice first of all, The man of flesh. Or we could say the woman of flesh. In other words, the mind of flesh, our mind, is set against God. Now we need to understand that. Our mind is set against God. It does not want God. Or we can be guided by the Holy Spirit. Now look at our text again. Look what he says. Verse 16, but I say unto you, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. 
For though these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things you want to do. Paul here begins to describe the warfare. It's the warfare of the flesh, sarks, the warfare of the flesh, and the warfare of the spirit. It is a battle, brothers and sisters, between a life that is led, that is pleasing to God, that is led by the Spirit of God, and it is the, it is the life that is led by fallen nature, serving ourselves, serving our pleasures, serving our desires, what we so want. It's a stark contrast, isn't it? There's really kind of no middle ground in that. It's a stark contrast between living for the flesh, living for our desires, and living for the Holy Spirit, pleasing to God in our lives. That's the contrast. That's what he's laying out here for us. It's a conflict. See, look, it's a conflict between the old creature, driven by sinful nature, and a new creature indwelt by the Spirit of God to live for the glory of God. That's the battle. That's the conflict. You see, all of us find ourselves in Romans chapter 7. You might want to go there and read that this afternoon or sometime during this week. Paul says, when I want to do good, evil is present. When I do evil, good is present. Who's going to be able to deliver me from this body I'm in? And he says, thanks God, thanks be to Thanks be Jesus Christ is the deliverer. And that's why he goes into Romans chapter 8 verse 1. He says, there is now therefore no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. You getting it? We live in Romans 7. We live in that wrestling, in that fight that goes on. It's a conflict. It contrasts. The huge, there's a huge contrast scene. I mean, look, look with me again, verse 19. He says, now the works of the flesh are evident. Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, adultery, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions and divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, things like these. I want you, as I warned you before, that those who do these things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithful, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there's no law. Wow, there it is. There's the contrast. There's the, there's the list, if you will. Now this morning, I want us to take just a few moments, and I really just want us to concentrate on the first list. Now notice with me this first list. Notice that the list includes sins that involve what? Sins that really do involve the soma. Sins that do involve the flesh. The list involves those sins that involve our bodies. And that list involves the sins that that are involved in our non-physical bodies. Notice what he says. Sexual immorality, having sex outside of marriage, living outside of marriage, fornication, drunkenness. He mentions drunkenness here. Sins committed, what? What are these, how are these sins committed? They're committed with our bodies. Now, but also we find something else here too. We not only see sins that are committed with our bodies, But we also see sins of envy and jealousy and adultery. Now that's not something we do. Our bodies are involved. They're involved in them, yes, but they're not involved physically. There's no physical exercise. In other words, it is a, now watch this, it is a mental attitude. It becomes our thinking process. So the Bible covers it both sides here. You see, the conflict is between the two styles of living. Do you live a life of the flesh or do you live the life of of the Spirit? So that's who the man of flesh is. That's the contrast. And number two, Paul says we are to be controlled 
by the Spirit. Now I want you to understand something. Well, when we say this, I really, this is a point that I really want you to get a grasp on. I really want you to grab this. I really, I really want you to leave here today understanding this. Because uh, we really need a grasp, lest we think, lest we get away with the idea. Now watch this. Lest we get away with the idea that righteousness somehow consists mainly of external acts. Listen, are you with me? Say amen if you're still with me this morning. We've got to be careful unless we think that righteousness is just external acts. Listen to what Romans 14, 17 says. For the kingdom of God is not a matter of what? Eating and drinking, that's external acts, but of righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. Listen, when we begin to focus on the externals, now watch this. Here's how we do it. Man, I don't cuss. You know, I don't go to Kingland. And you know, I've never bought an lottery ticket. You ever heard folks say these things? And I go to church on Sunday. And I give. And you know what else I do? <laughs> Preacher calls on me. I'm dismissing prayer even. What about that? I'll teach Sunday school. I'll help fix the building. And what do they begin to set up? They've set up a set of what? Rules. Here's the rules. This is what Christianity looks like. (laughs) And it has nothing to do with Christianity. It has nothing to do with the gospel. And what happens is, if we focus on the externals, we're no better than the Pharisees. The Pharisees were good at it. I mean, they knew how to pray. Listen, they knew how to pray. There was, listen, there was no more trustworthy. We, we, when we think of Pharisees, we think of what? Dirty, rotten scoundrels, right? That's what we think of them, but not in that day. I mean, if you're going to trust somebody, you can trust a Pharisee. Because he was of high moral integrity. But what did Jesus say about them? Jesus said, you are of your father, the devil. Jesus said that on the outside, you're like white worst sepulchers. You're, you're like beautiful tombstones. But on the inside, you're full of what? Dead men's bones. They had an external look. They had an external way of looking, but that was not true wrestling with the flesh and the spirit. They focused on outward activities outwardly they were something else but inwardly they had an envious heart are you with me inwardly they were full of envy and strife and evil it was a good cover but underneath the covers was sin you know we do it too don't we a polite gesture might reveal, might, might conceal a jealous heart. Right? A polite, a polite smile might conceal a envious heart. You know how we do it, don't you? Sometimes, you ever seen folks do this? Bless your heart. Well, bless your heart. That's a southern way of saying, you big dummy. <laughs> right? Now, not all the time, but that's, that's the way it is sometimes, isn't it? On the outward, we say something, but on the inward, there's something else, there's something else entirely different going on, right? 
Let's be careful not to focus on the externals. The Holy Spirit of God, listen, when it comes to sanctification, the Holy Spirit of God seeks to clean our lives up outwardly and inwardly. Are you with me? Now, that's one error. There's another error we've got to look at. And the other error is replacing righteousness, taking righteousness and just putting it on the internal realm. Just internalizing righteousness. You see, we can fool ourselves into thinking that all that matters is our heart. Can't we? Have you ever heard folks say that? You don't know my... You don't know my heart. And if we're not careful, we begin to internalize our walk. And that's not the answer either. We begin to think, well, behavior just really doesn't matter. I mean, I know Jesus... I talked to a girl this week, witnessed her, wrestling with her a little bit, talked with her a bit. And she says, you know, and, and, and here's what happened. She, she probably burnt by a church one time, but didn't love her like she should, should have been loved. Didn't walk with her through something. And see, I, and she, I, I'm just a little scared. So, so, so here's the deal. I know Jesus, and, we read my, and I read my Bible, but me and Jesus, you know, we, and, I, and I'll attend several churches, but I'm not going to get connected I said, have you ever heard of Tom T. Hall? She said, yes, I have. She said, I said, he has a song out that says this. Me and Jesus got our own thing going. Me and Jesus had got it all worked out. Y'all know that song? Some of you young ones have no clue even who Tom T. Hall is. But some of us with a little more gray in her hair, know who Tom T. Hall is. And what he's saying is, look, I don't need the church. I don't need those people. I've got it worked out with Jesus. It's okay inside. My heart is okay. And that is absolutely false. That's false. That has nothing to do with what the New Testament teaches. You see, what happened is we begin to want to internalize our salvation. You know my heart. Everything's okay. And we live like that. And when we live like that, we get easily to justify our sin. Begin to justify our sin. How many people have I talked to or maybe you've talked to? At work. Neighborhood, friends, family. Well, I just don't love them anymore. I just don't love them anymore. And they're dating somebody else. They're seeing somebody else. Because I love them. I love them. And what happens is when you internalize... The gospel, when you just internalize it and you keep it inside, you begin to justify adultery. It's okay. Hey, I know my heart. Ain't nobody else needs to tell me anything. I know my heart. So you begin to internalize adultery. You begin to internalize fornication. You can just sleep around. It's okay. It's okay if I sleep with my partner. It's all right. Just the way it is. I what? I love them. Don't tell me anything different. I don't want to hear anything different. Me and Jesus have our own thing going. Hello, are you with me? Now we may be walking a little deeper, but hang here with me. Now listen. Flesh doesn't exclusively refer to physical, but it does include them. You see, there are desires in our life. Every one of us this morning have desires in our life. And I just want to tell you, they're difficult to tame. Every one of us has desires that are difficult 
to tame. And, the, and those desires are not consistent. They're like the waves. They ebb and flow in our lives. Some days it's great. Other days it's not so great. Some days, man, I can take on the mountain. Other days, I want to run from the mountain. Have you been there? Not consistent, but they come. And they come in these waves. Let me give you an illustration. You see, it's easy to say I'm going on a diet after you've ate a big meal at supper. Isn't it? Isn't it easy after you've had fried chicken and corn and green beans and mashed potatoes and maybe some stuffing (laughs) and uh, Aunt Gladys' red velvet cake and, you know, just name off a few things. And you're laying there on the couch and your belly's about ready to bust. And you think, this is sinful. This is sinful. I'm going on a diet. Monday comes around and it's lunchtime. And you're hungry and it's been a busy morning. You're stressed and the Peking buffet looks awful good. Right? Right? It's easier to go on something after you've been down the road, but when it comes time again, it's another story, right? And what what goes on? I'll just tell you what goes on. I know what goes on. You begin to rationalize, don't you? I'm just going out with the guys. We're just going to go up there and eat some buffet. I'll get back on this thing tonight. Sure enough, you go up there and you have you about three or four of them fried cat legs, or whatever chicken <laughs> thing with jigs, and each is a little bit of that very bright vegetables that, when they bite into them, they got a little greasy taste up on. But they're good. Yeah, they are. And that night it's supper time and you're thinking, hey, I, I, I got it. And you don't. I'll start tomorrow. And tomorrow begins to be two years later. Are you with me? And here is what Paul is trying to get to us is that the Spirit seeks to teach us. Listen, now you got to get this. The Spirit seeks to teach us self-control. Wow, that's a tough one, isn't it? Let me just tell you what God's called us to do, brothers and sisters. God has called us to harness our physical desires to keep them in check. All of that talks about that in our text. Your sexual desires, if you're a believer, God's called you to harness them. Keep them in check. The envy you have, the strife you have, the anger you have towards somebody or something, God has called you to keep it in check. Now listen, the desire to eat is not sinful. No, it's normal. But desire runs out of control. And when desire runs out of control, what happens? We allow gluttony to enter our lives. Sexual impulses is a natural appetite. Hey, I've got news for you. God invented sex. Amen. God invented sex. But he provides marriage only for the context of it. You're sleeping outside of marriage, you're sinning against God. And I'm not just talking about homosexuality, I'm talking about, I'm talking about normal couples, I'm talking about young people, I'm talking about whoever you are. Normal heterosexual relationships outside of marriage, you're having sex, it is sinful. It is not pleasing to Christ. So outside of marriage, we are to abstain from any sexual activities. 
So sex and food and the pleasure of it is a gift from God. But when he gives it, he gives it with divine restrictions. And here's what sin is. Sin is the abuse of the gift that God gives us. Now listen, there's, there's involuntarily physical impulses. Do you know that? We have some involuntary physical For instance, my heart doesn't beat because I have a conviction that my heart ought to beat. Right? It doesn't, does it? My mind doesn't think because I have a conviction that my mind ought to think. No! Those are involuntary, 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 say it for me, Chuck. Involuntary, there we go. Involuntary actions of our body. That's just the way they are. Not all, but not all are involuntary. We are called by God. Listen, we are called by God to control our behavior. Listen to what Martin Luther said. Lust is not noticing that a woman is sexually attractive. Lust is born when we turn a simple awareness into a preoccupied fantasy. You with me? So we invite sexual thoughts into our mind. As a matter of fact, as a matter of fact, or anything else in this list. Adultery, sorcery, envy, strife, jealousy, anger. Rivalries, dissension, divisions, drunkenness, orgies. We invite these things into our minds and we begin to kind of neuter them, neuter them, bring them along. We, we begin to, to kind of dung them a little bit and put water on them and let the sun grow on them. And we begin to think them over a little bit. And all of a sudden the awareness now becomes what? Lust. Martin Luther said this, we can't help if a bird flies over our head. We can't help if a bird flies over our head, but it's another thing if we invite them to build a nest in our hair. Amen? Self-control, the rule for all of these battles. All these battles, the rule is self-control. Ephesians 5.3 says, But sexual immorality and impurity or covetous must not even be named among you as it is proper among the saints. Now listen, he just didn't jump on the folks that were sleeping with one another outside of marriage. He wasn't just talking about him. He was talking about those who are coveting too. You see, some of you are full of envy. Some of you are full of strife. Some of you are full of anger. Some of you are full of, of, of all of these fits of anger and rivalries and dissensions. And God says, put it away. Now I want to tell you, you know why it's hard to put it away? Because we, the world you and I live in today, everything I've been talking about, everything I've been talking about is attacked. Everything is. All of this. See, psychiatrists tell us, well, now look, these red-blooded American men and women, fornication is a normal and natural. It's natural for fallen humanity to fornicate. It's natural. And you know what? They are right. Listen, they are right. It is natural. It's also natural for us to lie. It's also natural for us to steal. It's also natural for us to cheat. Because that's what the natural person does and is. Wow. Look again at our text, verse 19. Now the works of the flesh are evident. Who? The flesh. Sexual immorality. You've got people living together. You've got people sleeping outside of marriage together. You've got... You've got Women chasing women, men chasing men. You, it's just sexual immorality is all over. Now let's not get all prideful there. Now let's, let's not get all puffed up because it gets a little worse. You've got impurity and sensuality, sensual things. Adultery, adultery. We 
None of us go and bow down before some idol at our house or at our work. But all of us at times worship something, don't we? Hmm? Sorcery. That means dealing, mixing other things in with true worship of the Lord. Em- enmity, causing division and strife. Jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, d- uh, 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 divisions. You see, some of these sins that he's mentioning are against ourself. But some of them are against what? Others. <laughs> How many families you know today are fussing and fighting over some money or some relationship or some land? How many of you know today that just can't get their hearts right because they, they're full of pride and they don't like this other person and what they've had to do or didn't do? Hmm? And the deal is, they all sit in church on Sunday. Hello. Now, they may not sit in the same church, although I have seen it where, where part of them sit over here and part of them sit over there. But the, new, the two shall never meet. And Paul is saying, look, you've got to take control of that. You've got to repent of that. You've got to fight that hatred, fight that dissension, fight that adultery. You gotta leave it. But the world would say, no, just live as you are. The call of God is self control in the midst of a fallen world. Now, why is God calling us to self control in the midst of this fallen world? Because we don't we're not living for this world. We're living for the world to come. That's the deal. Now I want to tell you, if we fall, if we fail, we're guilty of sin. So nobody can point too many fingers in here, can you? Any finger pointing going on in here this morning? We're all guilty. If we fail, we're guilty of sin. And I want to tell you something else. Those who are falling in sin, we must be patient with those who fall into sin. But we don't do them any service by changing the standards of God and bringing them down to our own feeble levels of performance. Listen, that is a scandalous thing to do. It is scandalous to God for us to seek to change His standards and call good evil and evil good. The flesh is friends with the world. (laughs) Amen. And the world is friends with Satan. And here... He seeks our destruction by calling us away from the Holy Spirit. Calling us away to surrender to the flesh. Surrender to what's comfortable. The Holy Spirit in the, is, the, is, the Holy Spirit is the believer's ally. And how sad it is that every day we're reminded of our, we're reminded of our minds our bodies aligned to the fallen world. While we forget that the children of God have the spirit to help them. In a world where the flesh seems to rule human activity, the Holy Spirit is still present with us to enable God's people to please Him. Romans 8.11 says, If the spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, He who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through His Spirit who dwells in you. So this morning, when we think about sanctification, we have to mortify the flesh. It is God's call. It is God working in us, yes. But it is God's call For our responsibility to do what? To put it away. To fight it and hate it. And live for him. Now listen, I'm going to close. 
Listen to me. That's why you need a church family. That's why if you're here and you're not a member here, you ought to plug in here. Because you need somebody. See, listen, eternal security is a community project. Are you with me? It's where you walk with fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. And they help you along. And they don't point fingers at you. They're not jumping down your throat. They're coming along beside you. Because all of us have a past. Amen? We all want to bring people along to a glorious future. And if you're here today and you don't know Christ, or maybe you're one that's made a quote-unquote profession of faith somewhere, but listen, you're living the way you want to live and it doesn't bother you, doesn't trouble you, then I plead with you to come to Christ today. Most of everything I've talked about today, if you're here and you're not a believer, really doesn't apply to you because you're still trapped. You're in bondage. You're in bondage to the lie, the devil, and the wickedness of your own heart because you don't want God. But God in Christ came to you. Died and buried and rose again the third day so you could have eternal life. But you've got to repent. And you've got to come to him. And I pray that that would be the case this morning. Father, thank you for the word of God. Thank you, Lord, for the convicting power of the word of God in our lives. And God, we, we, we come even now confessing to you that we have loved our flesh more than we have loved you many times in our lives. And we're thankful to believe the promise that you forgive those who confess their sins. And so, Lord, this day, may we declare as a church family that we're going to begin to continue the battle to hate sin in our lives and to push it away no matter the cost and live for your glory. And do what you call us to do. In Jesus' name. Amen. Stand up.